Thank you so much, and I'm delighted to be with you all today. Now, I'm a neuroscientist at the University of Cambridge, and I might be a little bit biased, but I'm going to proclaim now that we have been living over the last two decades in the era of the brain. There has been an explosion in new neuroscience knowledge. And that information has helped to inspire the creation of artificial intelligence systems. It's also helped to create brain-computer interfaces. But this information about our brains, about the neural networks that create our behavior, have also helped us to understand ourselves a little bit better as well. And all of this is exceptionally important. As we are faced with a number of existential problems, and as we try to live intelligently during this fifth industrial revolution, we can start to use this new neuroscience knowledge to our advantage. And that's exactly what I'm going to be exploring with you over the next 44 minutes. It's going to be looking at how we can start to use this new information about our brains and behavior so that we can not only play to our human innate strengths as our relationship with AI and new technologies continues to evolve, but more importantly, I think, what we can also do with this neuroscience knowledge is start to use it to better access the intelligence that resides within our own brains, so that we can better tap into the intelligence from the people around us, from the collective intelligence of our species on a, on a social but also a global level, so that we continue to evolve with human-centeredness at the core, and we think of our well-being, and so that we can also continue to have good relations with other people to build consensus, to develop our communication skills, and to work together so that we can continue to innovate and problem solve into the future. And so that's exactly what I'm going to be exploring with you, these neuroscience uh, information that helps us to understand these processes so that we can start to use these tips from neuroscience for our own lives and for the lives of people out there in society as well. Now, I'm going to start by asking you what do you think made you the person that you are today? So the habits that you hold, how you like to spend your time, with who and where. All of the choices that you've made in your life, what's helped to form those? As we have been able to peer into the brain as never before, what we've started to discover is that there's vast swaths of our complex behaviors which have a big biological underpinning. And that biology resides in the brain. If we look back, oh, oh dear. Sorry, there seems to be a glitch with the system. Is that, sh is that showing the correct slide? Um, obviously, my relationship with technology needs to evolve. <laughs> So, um, there, yeah, that's, that's correct. So, if we peer into our brains, if we start to look at how our brains were constructed in the first place, so when we were a baby in the womb, the genes that we were given from our mother and from our father, the DNA in the egg and the sperm as it fused, created a really unique blueprint for our life. And each one of us has a very individual a uh, sequence of nucleotides, of 3.2 billion base pairs of nucleotides that make up our DNA that is our blueprint for life. And when we start to analyze these genes, we can see that, uh, firstly, a high number of these genes are expressed predominantly in the brain. And these genes, thousands of them, converge and are associated with very complex behaviors. So we already knew that things like our height, our eye color, or hair color might be biologically predisposed, passed on to us from our mother and our father. But increasingly, we're finding out that some of our complex behaviors are also biologically predisposed too. So for example, complex things like how long we might live, 
how resilient we might be to mental health conditions, even our beliefs, our ideology, or our temperaments, our personality. All of these have a biological predisposition, and it's due to genes that are expressed primarily in the um, brain that are given to us from our mother and father. Now, when we peer into the brain, we can start to see how these genes have an effect on us as an individual. We can start to see how they encode for proteins that create some of the 86 billion nerve cells that live in our brain. And each one of those 86 billion nerve cells connects with up to 10,000 other nerve cells to create this incredibly intricate circuit board with around 86 trillion connections. And this circuit board uses the power of electricity in order to create our behavior and instruct us to interact with the world. And the reason that I'm saying it's electricity is because each one of these nerve cells basically has pores studded in it, sodium and potassium ion pores, and it allows those ions to be pumped in and out of that nerve cell membrane to allow the flow of electrical currents to zip across that nerve cell to the next nerve cell in the circuit. And that is how our neural networks operate. And that is how we can feel emotions, it's how we can problem solve, it's how we can learn from the environment and store knowledge within our brain using these signals, these electrical signals whooshing around our brain. Now, I'm a scientist, and so, like any good scientist, what I like to do is explore topics using experiments. And so I'm going to invite you all to do some experiments with me. So for the first experiment, I want to peer into somebody's brain and analyze their electrical signals in real time as they're thinking and feeling and creating. So is there anybody who would be willing to join me on stage to have their brain waves analyzed? Big round of applause, please, for this uh, first volunteer. Thank you. And if I could also get some help holding these electrodes. So what I've got here is an EG kit, and I'm going to be analyzing Stephanie. Stephanie's brain waves, those 86 billion nerve cells in Stephanie's brain. I'm going to be analyzing those as she thinks on stage. So I don't know, I'm not going to be analyzing her genes to find out what her behavior is like, but analyzing her brain waves. So I've got three electrodes. Don't disappoint me, brain waves. Don't disappoint me, brain waves. So if you could stand here, please, and um, thank you. And who's going to put this? Uh, he, says, he says, I hope you will find something inside. <laughs> so if you hold that very still there. Yeah, that's it. Good. How are you feeling, Stephanie? Pressured. You're pressured. The pressure. <laughs> OK. We'll probably pick that up from the brain waves. OK. So what we have here on the y-axis Oh, is potential difference in millivolts. Oh, you've got big brain waves, Stephanie. So I'm having to adjust the y-axis to accommodate Stephanie's electrical energy in her brain. So the green axis here, the green uh, bar here in the middle, is Stephanie's raw electrical oscillation zipping across her brain as she thinks. So I'm going to ask you, Stephanie, to concentrate on furiously wriggling your eyebrows. Are you doing that? Furiously wriggling your eyebrows, up and down, up and down. That's it. And so we're seeing an immediate response. I'm now going to ask you to stop doing that and stay still. So what we've got here on the red axis, on the red uh, graph, so scientists like to break down everything and classify them based on different categories. And electrical oscillations in the brain are no exception. The red uh, bandwidth at the top is so-called gamma waves. Now, gamma waves are the fastest speed of electrical oscillation that whoosh across the brain at the highest frequencies. And they allow Stephanie to have joined up thinking within her own brain. So electrical signals can access all the disparate regions across her brain as she thinks. And I'm going to ask Stephanie to now close her eyes and meditate. So what we should see is very difficult to do this, but what we should see is an increase in gamma wave, the red uh, oscillations, 
electrical activity as Stephanie meditates. The act of meditation is thought to increase gamma wave activity so that it helps us to use all of that information that's stored across the brain. We're not seeing a huge response here, but I can understand that Stephanie might find it difficult to meditate calmly <laughs> whilst in front of you all and having her brain waves scrutinized. So instead, Stephanie, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to take this Play-Doh and to create something with it. So create some kind of 3D shape. And we're seeing now an increase in both the gamma wave activity, but particularly seeing a change in the blue alpha wave activity. Now, the alpha wave activity is the slowest electrical oscillation that passes across the brain when we're awake, and it's associated with calm, creative thinking. So it's lovely to see that Stephanie's brain is responding with increased alpha wave activity as she engages in this creative task. So other ways that we can help to induce our alpha wave activity so that we can think innovatively and creatively is by taking ourselves out for a walk in nature and getting lost in the woods, for example, or outside. Um, now, delta and theta waves down here, we're not seeing much activity uh, for Stephanie's brain there in the delta and theta, and that's a really positive thing because those brain waves are actually, they help to signify that you're asleep. So I'm very pleased to see that Stephanie <laughs> isn't asleep at the moment. So they're really, really slow electrical oscillations that go across the brain, and that process of sleep inducing theta and delta wave actually allows new connections in the mind that have been formed as we learn things from our environment to then be consolidated into a firm connection within the brain, into a memory connection in the brain, so that it, that information from the previous day can be incorporated into our framework for knowledge for the next day. So it creates a really nice, stable, new circuit way in the brain. Now, the beta waves down here in the green are associated with Stephanie's concentrated, focused thinking. So it's lovely to see that she is concentrating and focusing at the moment. <laughs> now, a small amount of stress can actually be very good for beta waves activity. It can help to enhance that synaptic plasticity, that ability to form new connections in the mind so that you can learn new things and remember for, for, for um, the next days. But those, that stress can also, um, if it's chronic, it can actually impair both the alpha and the gamma wave activity, and it can start to strip away at connections in the brain. And in really chronic cases, it can actually cause the death of nerve cells in the brain. So anything that you can do to help protect your brain from the effects of stress, so as I said earlier, meditation and going out in nature to try and relax, or to try and engage in creative acts, all of this can help to protect your brain from any effects of stress. Now, neuroscientists have been interested for many, many years in how our brains work as individuals, but more recently, they've started to become fascinated with the idea of what happens when our brains work together. So when we work as a group, when we build consensus, when we communicate freely with each other, what's going on within our brains? Well, if we were to analyze Stephanie's brainwaves and my brainwaves as we work together on a task, what we'd start to see is that those electrical oscillations would become in step with each other. They'd become synchronized. And that degree of brain synchronicity can actually help to predict how well Stephanie and I are working together. So bearing that in mind, is there anything that Stephanie and I could do to help boost that degree of brain synchronicity? Well, yes, there is. So Stephanie, if we were to look each other in the eye directly, that would help to boost our brain synchronicity. If we were to sing with each other, I'm not going to ask you to do that right now. So can you can do it. <laughs> that, would, that would help. I can't. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want me to sing. <laughs> <laughs> so if we were to sing together, that would help our brain waves to start to become in step with each other. If we were to also exercise together, that would similarly help. 
Um, so that's just some of the findings from a recent neuroscience experiments that look at how we can start to boost the potential of our own brains, but how we can also start to work together more effectively and more intelligently. Huge thanks to Stephanie for allowing us to peer into her brain on stage. It's, you're happy to, thank you. I'm happy to. And what I've got here for Stephanie is um, just to say thank you for being such a willing victim, is a copy of my book, thank you. Science of Fades. Thank so you. thank you, and I can sign it for you later or for someone. Now, is there anything else from this new neuroscience knowledge that can be used by our species? This, this knowledge about the brain to help us understand our behavior or help to inspire new behaviors, for example? Well, yes. So, um, so, oh. so, new neuroscience knowledge has been used to, for example, in the last five, eight years, has been used with new neuroengineering approaches. And you may have heard of Elon Musk's projects, Neuralink projects, where, for example, He's embedded chips within the brain of a monkey to allow them to use those electrical oscillations within the monkey's brain so that the monkey can actually play the video game Pong with its mind directly. Or you may have seen videos in the last five years or so of the pig Gertrude. And as she explores the environment, they've been able to pick up on her electrical oscillations in her brain as she navigates the space. But there's been other developments as well that haven't perhaps been quite so well publicized, but they've been groundbreaking. So for example, there's been studies where there's been rats, and mice, learning new skills, and scientists have been able to take a copy of the electrical signature of that learned skill, take a copy of it, a snapshot of it, and then transpose it onto a donor rodent's brain so that that second rodent has learnt that skill that bit quicker. So the new skill has been primed onto that brain. There's also been studies where human brain nets have been created, where the brains of people have been connected using kits like this and allowing them to communicate with each other and play games like, how, you know, I don't know whether you've played the game, um, 20 questions where you've got to try and guess what an object is. So there have been groups of people playing that game together using simply their electrical oscillations as a mode of communication. And there's also, for example, this is a video of um, researchers working in Ireland. Uh, they've actually created a three-person closed loop system where they're using the electrical oscillations of one person and they're helping that person to induce alpha wave calm creativity within the brain, and then that's being contagiously transmitted to the next person in the closed loop, so that you're getting a spread of creativity going on in the electrical oscillations of those people within the experiment. These are absolutely fascinating developments. And there's obviously also been the creation of generative AI that has been very much inspired about our, by our knowledge of how neural no networks and neural networks operate. And these types of technological developments are only going to ex increase and have profoundly uh, bigger impacts on our society moving forwards. So moving back to us as humans, is there anything else that we should do to have some knowledge about our brains and the situations that they're in and how we can better harness the intelligence that's available to us? Well, yes, there is. And I'm going to ask you all to take part in this experiment so that we can explore this idea of how the environment or the situation that we're in can affect our brain oscillations. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to ask you to imagine that you are a position of power of profound power. This might not be very difficult for some of you. So imagine that you have a big influence on the people around you. So maybe you are a referee at a football match. Maybe you are chair of a committee meeting. Maybe you are a high court judge presiding over an important case. 
you have a big impact and influence over other people. And whilst you imagine that feeling of power, I'm going to ask you to take the hand that you write with and use the index finger to trace the letter E on your forehead. So trace the letter E on your forehead and remember the sensation of doing that. And you can now open your eyes. So what I saw the majority of you doing was writing an E. Well, some of you did it as a lowercase e, some of you did it as a capital E. That makes no difference whatsoever, I'm afraid. You can't read anything into that. But what I did notice was that most of you were writing an E in a way that made sense to you so that you could read it inside your mind, but it would have been mirror reversed for anybody looking from the outside at you. And this is what we find time and time and time again. When people are in a position of power, or whether they just imagine that they are in that position, then they are more likely to make decisions in a way that makes sense to their own mind, but they're less able to take on board other people's thoughts or the fact that they might have access to different bits of information or have a different perspective. So power actually increases egocentricity and decreases our emotional intelligence for other people. And when we look at the nervous system, when people are in a position of power, what we can see is that there's profound changes. So the electrical oscillations of the mirror neuron circuit, circuit, which is a circuit board within the brain that's thought to be involved in our ability to imitate other people and to also have emotional intelligence for other people, that circuit is dampen down in electrical activity when people are in a position of power. And similarly, when we look at the vagus nerve, which is a cable of nerves that runs from the brain all the way to the body, we can see that that, nerve, that electrical activity and that sensitivity of that cable is diminished when you're in a position of power. And the vagus nerve is really important for allowing us to pick up all the information that's stored within our bodies, within our gut and within our heart and the nervous system that's there, and sending it to our brain to say, hang on a second, there's some extra information that you haven't taken account of yet. So this is just a little alert to say, hang on a second, there's some more information from the environment, from the collective wisdom of people around you that you're just ignoring. And that's why you sometimes get that heart feeling, that heart flicker, or that gut feeling about something. It's that, that, that those nerves that are there in your embodied cognition, sending a signal via the vagus nerve to your brain to increase your awareness of others and the intelligence in the environment to help with your decision making. And power can actually dampen down your ability to do that. So knowing this, is there anything that neuroscience can also tell us about how we can immunize ourselves against this corrupting effect of power. Because obviously when you are in a position of power, you do need to sometimes ignore other people's uh, kind of emotions and their, their input, because otherwise you can be too swayed by all the information out there and then it's very difficult to make a decision at all. So in some ways, this effect of power on the brain and the body can be a very useful thing. But in other ways, it can go too far, and it can make leaders unempathetic and unable to tap into the wisdom from the environment around them. So is there anything that we can do to help make sure that when we're leaders, we are still balancing the collective intelligence with our ability to make decisions? Well, yes, neuroscience thinks that we can actually do this. So this study came from quite an unlikely source, I think. There was a guy called John Coates, and he used to work uh, on Wall Street, on the trading floor back in the day. And he made really important financial snap decisions based on the trading stocks and shares and what was going on at the time. And he was very, very successful at this. He made millions of dollars. And at one point, he kind of like was scratching his head and he was thinking to himself, you know, what is it about me that is so successful? Why am I so good at making money and making these decisions? And he had a hunch of an idea. So what he did was he took that hunch of an idea and he took his money 
and he retrained in neuroscience at the Judge Business School, which is where I met him at Cambridge University. And what he found in an admittedly small-scale study was that, firstly, traders are really good at listening to that information that's stored within their gut and within their heart. And actually, their ability to listen to that information, to have that nerve sensitivity, predicted how much profit they made during a period of economic downturn. So, knowing this, is there anything that we could all do so that we can enhance the way that we tap into this intuition, this embodied cognition, this collective intelligence from the world around us that's stored within our bodies that otherwise our brain might not take account of? Well, yes. Sarah Garfinkel, who's a professor at University College London, has been doing some groundbreaking work looking at how we can all enhance our vagal nerve activity. And so I'm going to ask you to take part in a little experiment if you feel that, that you can. So I'm going to ask you to stand up, and I'm going to ask you to get your heartbeat racing. So you might want to run on the spot. You might want to do some star jumps. Uh, anything that you can do to get your heart beating a little bit more strongly and a little bit more quickly. Um, so that's it. Keep running. I'm actually holding my hair because it's falling out. And um, that's it. So we're going to get our heart beating nice and strongly. The heart sends oxygen rushing around the body in the blood to the brain, because our brain uses something like 20% of our daily energy quota, and we need that oxygen to keep our brain uh, alive so that it can send those electrical signals so that we can think. Okay, that's wonderful. And now, if your heart is beating nice and strongly, you can sit down. <laughs> well done, everyone. And now, just spend 30 seconds trying to listen to that heartbeat. Should be beating a little bit more quickly now, a little bit more strongly so it's easier to detect. So spend some time listening to that heartbeat. And what Sarah Garfinkel has found that is that if we just spend a bit of time every day trying to tune in to that information that our body is sending us through our heart, then actually that can really help us to start to use all of that intelligence that's stored within our own bodies, as well as our brains, to help us with our decision making, and to help us to navigate the world intelligently. Now, is there anything else, any other knowledge from neuroscience, that can help us with our decision making, help us to live intelligently as we enter this fifth industrial revolution? Well, yes, I think there is. And it's this idea that we are, each of us, shaped not only by the genes we've been given from our mum and dad, but also from our experiences, from our culture and our society. And this is a really neat example of how that happens. So I'm going to ask you to take a look at this video. And as you get to the back end of the mask, the shadow information is telling you that the eyes and the nose are pointing backwards. But your brains, because you're used to seeing faces in the environment, are just ignoring that shadow information. You're just filtering it out. And you're seeing another face popping out. And you can't stop yourself from doing this. As try as much as you, as you want, you will always see another face rather than the back end of the hollow mask. And this is a really nice example of how our past experiences of seeing faces in our environment from when we were a baby all the way through our life has basically shaped our neural networks in our brain so that we filter information and discard certain bits of information if it doesn't fit in with our expectation of reality. There's another example of how this happens and how it happens really quickly to groups of people, to make them think in a similar way. So I'm going to ask everybody in this room to listen to this. Can you listen? So I'm, going to have, I'm going to put the microphone down here. Can you hear this? 
So it's very quiet, but gobbledygook, right? If you now listen to this. Sorry. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. Poor the camel. camel was kept in a cage. We're now going to go back to the original file. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage. And suddenly, it makes sense. So your brain has overlaid that sense of the camel was being kept at the cage of the zoo onto the gobbledygook, which had a similar cadence. So forevermore now, for those of you that actually heard that illusion, if you ever hear that gobbledygook again, you will decipher it as the camel was kept at the cage at the zoo. Just because those experiences were pl closely placed next to each other, and there was a similar cadence between the two sentences. So this is an example of how, as a group, your reality, your perception of the world, can change as a result of your group experiences. And if we think about the fact that each one of us has had a unique culmination of experiences throughout our lifetime, but also we've had some shared experiences too, you can start to see how, generally speaking, we each have a very individual perception of the world, and we each have very individual brain strengths given to us from our mum and our dad, from our genes, but also as a result of our experiences that shape how we see the world. And that creates within each of us a highly individualized circuit board for our mind. So there's no two people on this planet that will have exactly the same circuit board in the mind in terms of the way that that electrical signals are sent across the brain and processed based on our experiences and genes. And that's why when we get a group of people together, when there's a high diversity of uh, different strengths within that group of people, that's when we get a greater cognitive pool, a greater brain resource that we're then able to tap into. But also, that pool of brains, that group of brains, actually helps to balance out any biases, any errors in information processing that exists in any one person. And that's why, as we start to live intelligently, into the future, it makes sense for us to continue to develop the skills that we have in allowing us to communicate with each other, to allow us to discuss freely, so that we can each start to access other people's brain power and ramp up the cognitive resource that's available to us as a group of people. And you could see this really clearly during the pandemic. When people were forced into periods of isolation, not only did their physical health suffer, so it's known that um, isolation and feeling lonely can have profound effects on our physical health and also our mental health in terms of making us feel low in mood. But also, what research has discovered is that it caused a decrease, a sharp decline in IQ scores as people were forced to isolate. And those IQ scores, that intelligence, did revert back to normal as soon as the isolation measures were lifted. But that reversion actually occurred more slowly for people that were shielding. So there's some tips from neuroscience on how we can start to access other people's brains, brain power more effectively. And it's simple things like working as a group, but making sure that the group is composed of diverse people with diverse approaches in terms of their thinking. Also, making sure that each member of the group gets the chance to talk, to, to offer up their intelligence. That they feel confident in their area of expertise, that there's a good breadth of expertise on the table, and that people don't feel in competition with each other but they feel that they can actually collaborate. But the number one predicting factor for how well a group will work together and effectively problem solve isn't at the individual IQ scores of the members, but it's actually um, the gender ratio. So the higher the number of females in a group, 
the more effective that group will be at being able to harness the cognitive resource that's there. And that's because it's thought that females from a very young age are taught to listen and to take turns. And it's culturally appreciated for that gender stereotype. So it may be worthwhile instilling these skills in males as well, so that we can better access that cognitive resource that's available to us as a group. And I think some of these, as we continue to evolve our relationship with artificial intelligence systems and brain-computer interface systems, I think some of these tips from neuroscience on how we can work with other humans will probably transpose over to how we work successfully with artificial intelligence systems as well. Now, I also want to just very, with our last, very last experiment, I just want to kind of emphasize that we are living in a period, during a period of intense change, profound changes, and also huge amounts of global uncertainty and existential challenges. And sometimes all of this can be very, very overwhelming. And this ask of mine for us to work with each other, to collaborate and communicate effectively, can be quite a difficult thing to do. But I'm asking you to welcome a bit of ambiguity and uncertainty in life into your day-to-day -day routine so that you can continue to thrive as an individual, but also for us as a species to thrive into the future, to continue to innovate. So I'm going to ask for one volunteer to join me for a very experiment, uh, just to close this session. Can I just check that you haven't got an underlying heart condition? No, great, please join me on stage. <laughs> Big round of applause, please. So what I've got here, I'm afraid to say, is an electric shock panel. Uh, and what I'm gonna do to test your tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty is to apply this electric shock panel in one of the most exposed nerves in your bodies. So does anyone know where the most exposed nerve in the body is? It's actually the ulnar nerve. So the, there's a bundle of nerves that run all the way down. So if you could um, undo your cuff, please, just quickly. But sorry, yeah, that, that's it. Um, there's a bundle of nerves that run all the way down from the arm to the wrist. And we're going to apply this electric shock panel to the ulnar nerve by the funny bone. So how do you feel about um, risk and uncertainty and your tolerance for ambiguity? You're good at it. You're, you're calm and composed. You do seem very calm and composed, actually, in front of, yeah. You do see, seem like that, which is good. It's a good skill. So if you hold this in place here, okay, and then I'm going to switch it on. Okay. So ready, steady, go. And we can see here. How do you feel? That's good. So, so now our lovely volunteer is waving at you all, waving at members of the audience, that spark of electricity that willingness to put himself out there to experience this new thing has led to him to wave and hopefully make some friends with some of you out there. And similarly, when our brains can welcome a bit of ambiguity and, and, and have a high tolerance for uncertainty, that can spark a new thread of electricity rushing around our brains, allowing us to think in new ways and allowing us to innovate for the success of our species into the future. So huge thanks to our volunteer for allowing us to demonstrate that electric shock experiment. And um, just a kind of like closing note, my next door neighbor Kate has a very small, small version of this embedded within her brain to help treat her condition of Parkinson's. And it effectively switches off the tremors and some of the depression that she experiences as a result of that neurobiological condition. So huge thanks to the audience, to the hosts for allowing me to come and uh, talk with you and explore these issues with you in the session, and also to Stephanie for volunteering up her brainwaves. Thank you very much.